If we're talking to a high-level decision maker that has a thousand other things on their plate, they just need that 30-foot view, but then we show them a technical spec sheet or a 15-page white paper, it is not going to effectively get the point across. And in fact, we may actually come across as we're too technical and lose the sale. It's really important to understand who we're talking to. You're listening to Prospecting on Purpose, where we discuss all things prospecting, sales, business, and mindset. I'm your host, Sarah Murray, a sales champion who's here to show you that you can be a shark in business and still lead with intentionality and authenticity. Tune in each week as we dive into methods to connect with clients, communicate with confidence, and close the deal. Welcome to Prospecting on Purpose. Our mini-series continues with our fifth skill for effective selling, understanding sales assets and knowing how and when to use them. Being prepared with the right assets at the right time is what propels us forward to closing our deals. It keeps our customers on the journey that we want them to be on. They're not taking us off course because we're in the driver's seat. We're varsity team. To give you an overview of this episode's structure, we're going to get into a high-level review of the different types of sales assets, both internal and external, and then we'll review best practices on how and when to use them. So what is a sales asset? In a nutshell, they're any resource or tool that sales teams can use to help them sell more effectively. Sales assets can include anything from marketing materials and product demos to case studies and customer testimonials. The purpose of sales assets is to provide sellers with the information they need to educate, communicate, and engage potential customers, and ultimately close more deals. I'm using the term sales assets here, but other interchangeable terms can be sales tools, sales enablement, sales crutches, cheat sheets, and so on. So now we're going to open up a can of whoop assets and break down the different types of internal and external tools we can create, use, and refine over time. These examples are not all encompassing and not all of these are right for our businesses. They're just tools in our toolbox that we can use. So starting with internal tools, these resources are confidential and to be used inside the walls of the organization or within certain teams. These are things you wouldn't wanna share with a client but that the teams can use as a reference point to just more efficiently communicate with the customer. Running down the list of internal assets would be buyer personas. Different stakeholders have different decision-making capabilities and influence the outcome of the sale. It can be helpful to create an outline of that customer persona. What is the role within their organization? How much influence do they have in the decision-making process? What do they value? How do they like to receive information? Do they make decisions at 30,000 feet, so they just need the high-level overview? Or are they closer to the tarmac and they need those nitty-gritty details based on their role and how your product fills a need? Other terms for this would be ideal client or customer avatar. Next, we have sales playbooks. This is a comprehensive guide that teaches sellers how to be successful in the organization within their sales channels. Essentially, a playbook is a how to win strategy. It ideally includes an overview of buyer personas, which titles to pursue in our outreach, or an overview of sales assets and where to use them in the customer journey. Next up, we have win-loss stories. This is basically a step-by-step review on how a salesperson or a sales team strategically closed a deal so that others can learn and emulate that success. The same thing goes for if we lost a project. Can we conduct a post-mortem and examine areas where the sale went south so we learn from the loss and course correct for the next project? In this same vein, competitive analysis. How and what do our competitors' products function and what's our unique selling point if that comparison arises? And to round out our internal assets, we'll get into scripts. Scripts can be used for discovery calls. They can include different leading questions, points, or guidelines to help teams present with consistency. Of course, practice makes perfect, so we're not stumbling through our pitches. Scripts can also help with having an arsenal of practiced and rehearsed stories that we have at the ready that are unique and authentic to us. We have a great how-to breakdown of how to get a tight 90-second story in episode 11 of the podcast with storytelling coach Ravi Rajani. If you haven't listened to that one, I encourage you to go back and take a listen. Practice makes perfect and keeps you prepared for objections. This leads me to our next script, which we built last week. This is our overcoming objections cheat sheet. What common objections do we encounter and what's our script to respond when we're served an objection? We're sending those return volleys right back to the customer. Varsity team. 
Email scripts, these are pretty self-explanatory here, but ideally they're customizable so they can be uniquely edited as needed. We always want our authentic self to shine through. This is something I use when I find myself sending the same information over and over. I just save a template, customize it for my client, and then send it off, easy peasy. And then finally, another script is a product demo script. This walks sellers through a demonstration of the product features and benefits to help us better present the demo to our client. Woo, all right, we're feeling good about internal tools. Now let's get into those external assets. I'm gonna start with product demos because we just discussed the script that goes along with it. A product demo can be a physical product or an online software demo. The goal here is to give a realistic understanding of the design, look, structure, and implementation of what the client is buying. This next one's an oldie but a goodie and sometimes a necessary evil, so it has to be at the top of the list. Marketing collateral, brochures, flyers, promotional materials, we're all familiar with these assets. I'm going to throw swag in this category too. When it comes to swag, I have mixed feelings. I think as long as it's done with intentionality and thoughtfulness, it can have a really nice effect. I do have one quick fun story. Uh, one time I spent a lot of money on these really cool summertime tumblers for cold drinks. They were you know, 32 ounces, had a straw and a lid. They were really nice and everyone wanted one. And I had printed the customer's logo and my logo on either side of this tumbler. And one really fun side effect that happened with this swag, I would have never thought about this, but it sat on people's desks. And because I'm a little networker, I'm friends with all my other vendor friends and sales reps, manufacturers would be in that office, see the tumbler and my logo on the desk and say, oh, you know, Sarah. And now I'm being talked about when I'm not even there. It was a really cool side effect of the swag. So I wanted to share that story. And now. In that same thread of collateral, we get to the queen bee of sales assets, the presentation deck, a tool that helps us walk our clients through the value they're getting when they partner with us and our widget, especially handy in the times of coronavirus and that work from home structure. If we're using this tool, we need to make sure that we know the deck and where the messaging and images are located. Very similar to our scripts, we need to understand and know the material we are presenting. Moving on to case studies, written or video, they usually live online. Hopefully it's on our websites and in our playbooks so we can pull out a practice story when it's appropriate. Case studies are usually structured to present a client's challenge, our solution we deployed to overcome the challenge, and the results the client experienced because they picked us. This is great because it serves as a third-party testament to the validity of our product, and ideally, varsity sellers are pulling up appropriate case studies that are the most similar to the challenge the client has, essentially putting them in the case study client's shoes. Video case studies are a great way to do that because it adds that human element. This client loved our product so much that they agreed to go on camera and speak about their problems, our solutions, our quality, or our service. It gives that human touch and establishes trust. Similar to a case study, but usually with less specific details, written or video testimonials are great to expand a wide variety of that validity, so now we have multiple clients singing our praises. How-to videos on how to use, install, or maximize the product make it easy for a prospect to do their own research and get a deeper understanding of how everything works. It also adds to the depository of resources we have so that the client can see how much support they'll have when they select a partner with us. Similar to how-to videos, blog posts, podcasts, or other forms of free resourceful content help establish expertise. And jumping into more technical resources, specification sheets or product sheets describe the technical features of our product. White papers are long-form assets that promote our company's thought leadership on a topic or they can be proprietary research, an in-depth explanation of an issue or a challenge, how our product integrates with other companies' products, or industry trends and predictions. Webinars, again, allow for prospects or clients to become better educated about our product or service. And then training programs are internal and external resources that can include workshops, online courses, or other training programs that help salespeople improve their skills and techniques, or clients become more skilled at understanding and deploying our product if it fits within their business model. And then to end on my favorite external resource, I am a sucker for a one-pager. It's one page of information, or two or three or four, but really a one-pager is a succinct piece that can quickly communicate the high-hitting points at a glance. 
I like to think of a one pager as like a sizzle reel for the full movie. All right, customer, grab your popcorn. Here's the trailer and please engage with me if you want the feature film. This is really important in B2B selling where we don't always have a meeting with the core decision maker. And again, I'm beating the drum, but it's important that one pagers are not all product facts, but the business benefits the buyers receive if they select our product or service. The goal of the one pager is to get the deeper meeting, to get into the details of that specific client's needs. For my business, I have a one pager for my keynote speech and my workshops. So at a quick glance, an event planner or a sales leader can understand what I speak about. I'm going to read us the beginning of my one pager and in the vein of a sizzle reel, I'm going to read it in the way that I read it in my head and that I wish my customers read it. So buckle your seatbelts because the trailer's about to start. Prospecting on purpose workshop. Learning how to build relationship currency is a lost art form in a world of instant gratification, inauthenticity, and underappreciation of human connection. We're rusty. We're putting business first and human second. We're having product-led conversations which are boring, scripted, and inauthentic to who we are. Not only are we leaving impact on the table, but sellers are leaving money on the table. In order to communicate with a prospect to land the meeting, you need to learn how to become genuinely interested in them by finding connection points way before your product pitch. The Prospecting on Purpose framework will teach you how to communicate with prospects in a way that builds trust, leads to business without feeling salesy, and creates a foundation for long-term relationships resulting in repeat loyal business. By the end of your time with Sarah, your team will learn and immediately implement the building blocks required to connect with clients, communicate with confidence, and land the meeting. And then after that, I have learning objectives. What are the tangible takeaways they will learn after the workshop? I have a testimonial, and then I have two reference points. It all fits on one page. It's quick and to the point. Do you need this or not? What it doesn't have is the logistics of the workshop. It's 90 minutes, three hours, full day options. It's available in person or virtual. We'll use Zoom for 90 minutes, or if it's in person, we need a whiteboard and a projector. Those details and conversations come later after the sizzle reel got the meeting. But a lot of times we start with that information. So keeping that sizzle reel mentality when we're creating one pagers is a nice little reference point. Okay, I know we're going through a lot here, so to wrap this up, we're going to cover some best practices on how to use our assets. First tip, shouldn't be a surprise, we are building on the other crucial skills with the how and the when we're using these tools. So some examples here. When we're thinking about business model as a crucial skill, an internal tool that we can use could be a buyer persona. What's the best fit for that client and how do they want to be sold to? If we're talking to a high-level decision maker that has a thousand other things on their plate, they just need that 30-foot view, but then we show them a technical spec sheet or a 15-page white paper, it is not going to effectively get the point across, and in fact, we may actually come across as we're too technical and lose the sale. It's really important to understand who we're talking to. Storytelling as a crucial skill? Our presentation can't just be product details. A slide deck that's full of facts and figures, no one's retaining that info, we've learned this. So an internal tool can be a storytelling script and practice, and the external tool can be a presentation that weaves in case studies, testimonials, and relatable stories that puts your client in the shoes of the hero of that story. Most assets need an element of storytelling to them. And then handling objections, our fourth crucial skill. We have that internal cheat sheet that has our common objections and our return volleys, but an external tool can be something that illustrates the objection and the solution visibly. Maybe cost is a huge roadblock, but we can prove that ROI with an active client case study. Let's add it to our decks and bring it up before the customer can address the concern. All right, second tip. When we don't always have a seat with the decision maker, I like to ask myself, which tool is the easiest to be forwarded that will communicate this on my behalf when I'm not in the room? Think of the assets that are easy to forward. I love one pagers and today's day videos seem to be crucial. So of course, links to appropriate videos on your site or YouTube can quickly get the message across. One tool I've been seeing and starting to use, and I think it's quite clever, there's a software called Loom. L-O-O-M, and it allows us to record our screen with our voice talking over it. So we can walk our clients through visibly and verbally what we want them to understand. So instead of spending an hour crafting an email with a bunch of bullets trying to explain our product or answer a customer's question, how great would it be to just pull up the asset on our computer screen, 
verbally walk through it. Our face can be on camera or not. We get a pic and then we send it off with a quick loom video. It's pretty cool and I'm starting to use it more, so I suggest you to check it out. Next tip, keep tabs on which tools work. Where we could have used a message or a resource that was missing and pass that feedback to marketing, but share a why behind it. Why is that piece missing from our toolbox? What questions are we getting that we can't answer that we think this would solve? And how can it be used to benefit the client, the sellers, and ultimately the company? And on that same note, feedback is important. We need to be sharing with our teammates, sharing with our peers, what's working, what's missing. Maybe we use a tool every day that our teammate doesn't even realize exists. Or if we use it and we practice it and we realize something's out of order with the organic flow, can we try it this way? Try it, test it, document that feedback on what's working and what's not working. It's an evolving process. And the final tip, a successful sales asset requires alignment between sales and marketing. There has to be a balance between the two. Sometimes the dance between salespeople and marketers can be quite delicate, and that is a topic for a future episode. But ideally, there's synergy and alignment, and both teams are communicating. And as we're on the subject of marketing, one of the most important assets we have before we even begin to get into a sales cycle is our brand. How are our companies outwardly communicating our brand image? What story are we telling the world? How are we reaching new people and more people and pulling them in to engage with us? We have to get the fish on the line before we can reel them in. Well, I have a lovely surprise for us to help do just that. Next week's guest expert is Jay Datani, who is the global head of social, marketing, editorial, and content strategy for Canva. If you haven't heard of Canva, you need to go play with it right now. It's truly a one-stop shop for the creation of any type of sales asset. They're really removing the barrier to entry to put control of design in our own hands. I use it in my business. It's how we design the podcast cover art, proposals, presentations, workbooks, video clips. Everything is done in Canva. I could not be a bigger fan, and the episode is really awesome. Jay shares with us four points of operating in an attention economy. It's a great episode, it's a lot of fun, and it's packed with a lot of value. So that wraps up our fifth crucial skill. We've identified a majority of internal and external sales assets at our disposal and best practices for implementation. Next week, we'll hear from Jay, and the following week, we'll dive into our sixth crucial skill, ensuring that we are staying in the driver's seat during the sales process. All right, so now let's go kick some assets. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next week. Thank you so much for listening to the Prospecting on Purpose podcast. If you loved what you heard today, subscribe to the podcast and please rate and leave a review. For more info on me or if you'd like to work together, feel free to go to my website, sarahmurray.com. On social media, I'm usually hanging out at Sarah Murray Sales. Thanks again for joining me and I'll see you next time.